Okay, let's go. Welcome everyone. Now let's see, today is week five of the 23rd semester for the master's degree, uh, massive open online course for the master's degree at, at the University of Nicosia. And uh, I'm Andreas Antonopoulos and I'll be answering your questions from the last week from the forum. So first of all, let me know in the chat that you can hear me, you can see me, everything's okay. Give me a little thumbs up just so I know we're all here. And then we'll get started. As always, we're looking to answer first the questions that are in the forum. Um, and then we're going to answer um, questions that are follow-ups from the chat. So if you have a follow-up question, if while I'm asking something you need a clarification, ask it in the chat and I'll see if uh, it's something I can answer that's immediately relevant. I still don't see anyone in the chat telling me that you can hear me. I hope you can. Chat is disabled. Well, that would explain it. Um, Manos, if you could please, uh, and thank you Anonymous for putting that in the Q&A so that I can see it. Uh, Manos, if you could please enable the chat. I don't think I, oh, oh, hey, there we go. Fantastic. All right, so uh, what we're looking to do today is answer the questions in the forum. Then if you have a follow-up question that is directly related to the thing I'm talking about, where you need a clarification or follow-up, just put it in the chat, put follow-up or clarification in front so I can see it, and then I'll answer that if it's relevant. Um, and then finally, if you have a question that's not directly related to what I'm saying, um, please put it in the Q&A and uh, we'll answer that next. Okay. So a lot of the questions uh, this week were on the topic of segregated witness. And so before I go and answer the questions, I want to just briefly explain what SegWit is, why it exists, and how it works. Segregated witness was introduced in 2017. And it was introduced to solve one major problem, and that was transaction malleability. However, as a side effect, SegWit also enabled um, Bitcoin to have uh, larger blocks, um, almost up to four times larger blocks. So it allowed Bitcoin to exceed the block limit of one megabyte um, and go up to four megabytes under certain circumstances in such a way that it was acceptable as a compromise solution to the majority of the miners, uh, the developers, and others who participated in uh, the activation process of SegWit. So primary purpose, fixing transaction malleability. Secondary purpose, increasing the capacity of the blockchain um, by expanding the block size from one megabyte to effectively four megabytes. So in order to explain what segregated witnesses, we have to first explain what, um, what happened before segregated witness, how signatures were implemented, and how the implementation of signatures and transaction hashes could lead to um, a phenomenon called transaction malleability and why this is bad. So first of all, let's go a bit deeper into what a signature is uh, and explain a bit more how a signature is applied. So a digital signature is a number that is calculated from two inputs. Um, the first input is the user's private key. Um, so the user who is signing uses their private key to apply, to calculate a signature. And what that does is it uh, allows everybody else to verify that that signature was made by the person who owns that private key. And everybody else can calculate that the signature is related to the public key um, without seeing the private key. And only the user who owns the private key uh, can actually could have created this number, this digital signature, could have calculated this digital signature. So it's a mechanism for um, authorization and authentication. 
authentication, meaning that it allows everyone who is verifying the signature to verify that it came from the owner of the private key, and therefore it authenticates the identity um, of the owner essentially against the public key. Not their real identity, their real world identity, but it, it, it allows people to tie the signature to the public key and say, yes, this signature was created by whoever had the private key. Authorization, because by using that mechanism, the owner of the funds can signal to the rest of the network through their signature, yes, I authorized this money to be spent. So authentication, authorization. There's another component to it, though, which is understanding what exactly the signature is signing. So I said that the, the, the formula for calculating the digital signature takes two inputs. One of them is the private key. The other one is a digital fingerprint of the message that is being signed. In this case, the digital fingerprint of the transaction or the hash of the transaction. There's some confusion between the two concepts of digital fingerprint and digital signature, um, and they're distinct. A digital fingerprint is a calculation from a hash. So it is the hash of a transaction. If you want to fingerprint a transaction, you calculate its SHA-256 hash. And then what that hash does is it binds that transaction so you can't change anything. Because if you change anything in the transaction, it would change the hash. So it acts as a digital fingerprint that uniquely identifies that transaction and prevents it from being changed at a later point. Now, the digital signature is calculated by applying the private key and this fingerprint, this hash of the transaction together and calculating a digital signature. So when someone is verifying the digital signature, they're not just verifying that it was signed by that owner. They're also verifying that what was signed was the hash of this specific transaction. So the digital signature is calculated based on a specific hash or fingerprint of a specific transaction. And that means that when you verify it, you know that the owner signed it and what they signed was this transaction exactly as it is. So it locks the content of the transaction. It locks the inputs and the outputs so that um, the transaction cannot be modified to pay someone else, for example, or to spend more in fees or to change the amounts, the recipient, the inputs, whatever. So the digital signature serves to uh, also protect the integrity of the transaction, authorization, authentication, and integrity. And the integrity means that you can't modify the transaction once it's being signed because the signature on the fingerprint of the transaction has locked all of the information in there. Now, in the original implementation of Bitcoin, the transaction ID and the signature were calculated in two different ways. The transaction ID was a hash of the entire transaction, including the signature. And of course, the fingerprint that we used in the signature was the entire transaction except for the signature. Why? Because you can't sign a fingerprint that contains the signature because that creates a circular situation. If you're calculating the signature on top of the fingerprint and the fingerprint has to include the signature, then how do you calculate the signature if it has to be included in the fingerprint that you need to calculate the signature that is inside the fingerprint that is used to calculate the signature that is inside the fingerprint? You see what the problem is, right? So a signature can't sign itself. It can't be calculated based on itself. So in the original Bitcoin implementation, the digital signature signed the fingerprint of the transaction of everything except the signature, but the transaction ID was a fingerprint of the transaction including the signature. So they were two different fingerprints. One included the signature, the other one didn't. And this caused the problem. It caused the problem because a lot of software used the transaction ID, the fingerprint that included the signature, um, 
in order to identify specific transactions on the blockchain. Now, here's the thing. As I said before, the signature binds and commits, if you like, every element of the transaction because it's signing the fingerprint and therefore um, you can't modify anything because that would change the fingerprint and therefore make the signature invalid. But as I said before, the signature doesn't sign itself. So what if you could change the signature in such a way that it doesn't invalidate the signature Oh, I seem to have lost the connection. Let's wait for a second. Okay, yes, my secondary connection left, but can you still see me? All right. I have a backup because of last time. All right, continuing. So um, people found that they could actually modify the signature and that didn't invalidate the transaction because if you modify the signature um, and it's still a valid signature, but different, then um, the transaction is still valid. But if you calculate the fingerprint of that transaction for the transaction ID, the transaction ID of the transaction has changed. So essentially you can create a duplicate of the transaction where everything is the same the inputs, the outputs, the amounts, everything except for the signature. And that creates a duplicate transaction where everything is the same except for the transaction ID that is now changed. The way you could do that is by taking advantage of the fact that the digital signature is just a number. So let's say, for example, that the digital signature is the number three, right? So what if I could write that three uh, in a different numerical notation, which still validated in the digital signature equation. I'll give you a silly example just to explain this. If I modify the signature, so instead of three, it was written as zero three. So I added a zero in front of it. Um, and I, if I plug that into the validation equation, the signature three and the signature zero three, which has an extra digit, um, validate exactly the same because numerically three and zero three is the same number. So if I took a transaction that you've signed and I went in and I changed the signature and instead of three that you signed, that you produced, that I can't produce that number because I don't have the private key, but I can just put a zero in front of it. I've got a new transaction that is valid. Um, but because I've modified the signature by adding something that doesn't affect it, the transaction ID changes because the transaction ID is a fingerprint of everything, including the signature. And therefore, that additional zero digit that didn't affect the signature does affect the transaction ID. So I have a duplicate transaction with a different ID that spends the same money and pays the same person. Now, if I transmit that to the network, maybe your transaction the original gets validated, maybe my transaction gets validated. It's merely a matter of which one the miners see first. Um, if I transmit it directly to a miner, maybe I get it in before yours does. And as a result, now that transaction that I malleated, that I modified gets verified and it's a valid transaction, just like the original. It's spending the same money to the same recipient. I can't change who you paid. But what I've done is I've created a transaction on the network that spent your money, but which has a transaction ID you don't recognize. So if you were looking for your transaction ID, you don't see it. And this caused havoc to bits of software that depended on the transaction ID. Most importantly, it made it impossible to have the Lightning Network because the Lightning Network depends on having signed transactions whose ID doesn't change that you can commit at any moment in time. SegWit changed Bitcoin in one simple way. It changed how we calculate the transaction ID so that the transaction ID and the fingerprint that's used in the signature are calculated the same way and neither of them include the signature. It moved the signature outside of the calculation 
for the transaction fingerprint, the transaction ID. And that way, if you modify the signature, it doesn't change the transaction ID at all. And if it doesn't change the transaction ID, you can't malleate a transaction. So I hope that explains SegWit. Uh, SegWit was implemented to fix this weird bug, um, which was causing um, problems in, in poorly implemented software, but was also um, preventing us from implementing the Lightning Network. SegWit opened the door for an implementation of the Lightning Network that was secure. There's a second aspect to this, which is, OK, so if you don't calculate the signature in the transaction fingerprint, where is the signature? The signature is just carried along uh, with the transaction. And what it does is it essentially, um, since you have all of the transaction fingerprints summarized in the Merkle tree of transactions, you need to also summarize all of the signatures. So you create another Merkle tree called the witness tree. And then you put the Merkle rule, uh, the Merkle root, the root of that hash tree, the witness Merkle root goes in the coin base in the first uh, transaction in the block instead of in the header where the Merkle root of the transaction uh, fingerprints goes, the Merkle root of the signature fingerprints goes in um, the coin base. And this allows you to basically carry the signatures and verify the signatures exactly as you do before. Um, so all, all of the software is still verifying all of the signatures. Um, they're just carried in a different part of the block than the um, transaction IDs. Now, in order to sweeten the implementation, in order to encourage people to implement SegWit, um, it was decided to uh, basically count the signatures differently. Now, the signatures are no longer in the transactions um, that are stored in the block. They're carried in a separate data structure. You still have to store them on disk if you're validating everything with a full node client. You still have to validate all of the transactions, but they're, they're carried in a separate data structure. And to make it more um, appealing for people to implement SegWit, um, there was a discount offered. And this answers Renato's questions from the chat. Why is this implementation increasing the block size? And the reason it was increasing the block size was to sweeten the uh, incentives, to make it an incentive for people to implement SegWit. Why would you use SegWit? Well, you would use SegWit. In order to use SegWit, you would have to change your wallet. You would have to change the addresses you use for your wallet. You would have to update all of the software you use in your wallet. Why would you do that? Well, what if you could get lower transaction fees? Why? Because the size of your transaction is calculated differently now that the, the witnesses, the signatures, are in a separate part. And by giving you a discount on the way the um, signatures are calculated, one, it encourages you to use SegWit because a transaction that uses SegWit is going to have lower fees because it's going to be calculated to be a smaller transaction. It's not a smaller transaction. It's exactly the same size. Uh, you still, everyone has to carry that data on the network. Um, you're just given a discount if you put your signatures in the back of the bus or in the, <laughs> if you like, in the, uh, in the checked luggage instead of in the overhead compartments, right? Um, and that encourages more people to put the signatures in the check luggage. It's still being carried by the block. It, if you like this analogy, it's still on the plane. It's just instead of putting it in the overhead compartment, you put it in the check luggage. But it, what if we weighed them differently? And we said, if you weigh it, the carry-on luggage, we're going to weigh the same, but for the check luggage, we're going to count um, half the weight. So if it's a 20 kilo bag, we're only going to count it and charge you for 10 kilos. That's basically what the discount did. 
it, the discount was actually 75%. So if it was a 10 kilo uh, bag, you only paid for two and a half kilos. You paid for one quarter of the weight. If you put it in the witness side, in the checked luggage, if you like, um, than if you put it in the overhead compartments. And this is important to understand because people are like, but does that mean that you, you're storing less data on the blockchain? No, it doesn't make, if you, it, it, the plane is still carrying the same amount of luggage. Um, the only difference is how you charge it. So it's an accounting trick that allows people to do that. And what it does is it changes the behavior of the user. It encourages people to put transaction signatures to use SegWit uh, to get the discount and therefore save on fees. But there's another really important reason why we do this, and that is that complex transactions, transactions that are not simply private key signatures, but involve complex scripts, things like multisig, or in the case of the Lightning Network, things like complex Lightning Network signatures, which are both multisig and time locks. Uh, so in a Lightning signature, you have if both people agree with this two of two multi-sig, then spend it. Or if so many uh, blocks have passed since this was created and one person signs with this key, then spend it. Or if the other person signs with that key, then spend it. That's the kind of script that is inside a lightning transaction that allows people to uh, either collaborate to close a channel or close it uh, single-handedly if some time passes and the other person has disappeared. Well, that's a very long script. That's like four times bigger than the rest of the transaction data is the signature. So by giving a discount of SegWit, you're also enabling complex protocols like the Lightning Network to produce transactions with big complex signature scripts that are discounted in such a way as to encourage the use of those protocols too. So that covers SegWit, and that covers SegWit and the why, the how, um, and its relationship to the Lightning Network. And now that I've covered all of that, um, let's look at quickly. Uh, Sangram asks, when the transaction is maleated by the malicious actor, is it done in the mempool or somewhere else? Um, so there is no the mempool. Every node has its own mempool. If I was malleating Manos's transaction, I would see Manos transmit his transaction on the on the network. I would, before it's been confirmed, I would take it, malleate it, produce a duplicate transaction, and then I would broadcast the duplicate transaction. So I'm basically trying to get my malleated transaction into a miner's mempool before Manos's transaction gets into a miner's mempool, so that my malleated one gets mined and confirmed first. And one of the ways I would do that is perhaps set up my node to connect directly to a miner's node rather than just randomly in the network so that I can inject that transaction into a miner's node that would put it in the miner's mempool faster than Manos's transaction. And that's basically what people were doing, attackers were doing. And we don't know who these attackers were. You know, one obvious answer is that miners can do this. Uh, obviously, if you're a miner, then you can malleate transactions faster than everyone else because you're on the. Uh, we, you may have direct connections to other miners because you are are running uh, an additional mining protocol network, or um, you you mine the block, so you can choose to ignore. Manos's original transaction and mine Andreas's malleated transaction on purpose if you are the miner. Dora asks, the Coinbase transaction has both the miner's reward and the witness Merkle root? Yes. The output is the miner's reward. The input part of the Coinbase transaction is where the witness Merkle root goes. All right. And now let's go to the questions in the forum. We've done the follow-ups. I think you've all captured this information well. Milo Guastamacchia asks, Dear Andreas, can you kindly confirm how the Merkle root of the wet witness data is added to the block header? Does it remain as a separate Merkle root from the transaction root? Or is it concatenated with the transaction root to form a unique composite Merkle root? 
I, I've already answered this effectively through our Q&A, but let me clarify it again. The transaction route goes in the header. The witness route goes in the input of the coin base and therefore is not in the header. However, it is merged in the transaction route indirectly because if you remember, the transaction route contains the identity, the fingerprint of every transaction in the block. The Coinbase transaction is a transaction in the block. The Coinbase transaction as its input has the Merkle root of the witness tree. And so when you put the witness tree Merkle root in the Coinbase transaction, and then you calculate the transaction ID of the Coinbase transaction and put that in the transaction Merkle tree, uh, the transaction Merkle tree effectively is changed by the witness uh, Merkle root. So they are merged, but they're merged indirectly. They're merged because the witness is inside um, the Coinbase and the transaction ID of the Coinbase is inside the transaction tree. Okay, give me one second. Let me just pause for a second. I just got an urgent message and also I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. And we're back. As a reminder, if you have follow-up questions, please use the chat. If they're not directly related to the topic I'm covering, please use the Q&A and I will get to them at the end as quickly as I can. Wolfgang Lohmann asks, the slides mentioned there could be more than 100,000 full nodes. Question, why are they called full nodes even though they do not produce any block and do not have an effect on what block comes into the blockchain? That's a great question. This terminology has evolved over time. So what we used to call a full node may not be what we call a full node today. I prefer to add a qualifying word to better understand what we mean. When we say full node, I would prefer to call that a fully validating node because that's what a full node does. A full node validates all transactions. So then you might ask, well, what kind of node doesn't validate everything? That would be a lightweight node. A lightweight node using a lightweight protocol trusts the miners to do the validation and doesn't validate transactions and blocks itself. And this allows you to run a node on a much smaller device, for example, on a smartphone that can still receive blocks and confirm the block headers and therefore trust the miners, but doesn't validate every transaction in the block. It just is interested only in the transactions that uh, contain its own keys. So it's a lightweight client. So when we say full nodes, what we mean is nodes that fully validate. Well, how is that different from a mining node? All mining nodes are full nodes. If a miner is using a node to validate uh, transactions for mining, that's a fully validating node. But the miner is using it not just to fully validate transactions, but also um, to build a candidate block for mining. Not all miners do that, of course. Many miners mine through a pool. In that case, the pool is running the fully validating node. The miner is running a lightweight mining client that trusts the pool to construct the correct candidate block. So it really is a matter of where do you put the trust? When we say fully validating node, we mean one that authoritatively validates everything. Um, are we having a problem with the chat? I just saw a message from, no, it's, uh, so Heil, if you're having a problem, uh, it appears that others, no, people are sending messages to hosts and panelists instead of in the chat. Um, can we just check that everything can work there? Good. Second question from Wolf Wolfgang, 
I understand the clients that run the node software might be able to signal support or rejection to a BIP that therefore have an effect to changes of Bitcoin with their decision. This is the kind of voting that happens during a, a fork. But as far as I know, it's very easy to set up simple virtual computers on AWS. Yes, in fact, many, many, if not the majority of um, fully validating nodes run in the cloud, run on cloud services like Amazon Web Services. So question, how can one be sure that in the case of controversial voting, some financial strong actors do not create 100,000 virtual instances to signal acceptance? For example, some controversial BIP. <laughs> uh, Wolfgang, so astute. What a great question. You hit the nail on the head. This actually happened. During the voting for SegWit, there was a lot of controversy because some people wanted uh, to run big blocks um, and some people wanted to run SegWit. So uh, there were various mechanisms that people used to signal with their fully validating nodes uh, that they uh, agreed to uh, one side or the other of that very controversial vote. So that signaling was very unreliable because some actor could simply create uh, nodes. And what we saw, we saw suddenly about 10,000 new nodes appear, all of which were running in the cloud um, and all of which were voting in a specific way. In that case, it was voting in favor of what became Bitcoin Cash, the big block side. Um, and and so uh, this is exactly what happened, which is why you cannot trust uh, full nodes to vote because anyone could run a full node on any kind of hardware, including spinning up 10,000 nano instances on AWS that only cost three cents an hour to run um, and run them for a few days to, to, to botch the vote. This type of attack is called a Sybil attack, S-Y-B-I-L. Um, another way you may hear it on the internet is the idea of sock puppets. Uh, basically someone pretending to be many different people. On social media, we call that sock puppets. The generic term for that in distributed systems is called the Sybil attack. When you create the illusion of multiple um, independently running virtual computers in order to change the way a network works. Mining is the solution that Satoshi Nakamoto created in order to prevent Sybil attacks on Bitcoin, meaning that because with mining, you have to provide proof of work, it doesn't simply cost you three cents an hour to run a virtual computer. You have to produce energy uh, committing work that shows that this actually has an impact. In a way, you have to put a lot more money behind a mining node than you do a fully validating node, and that prevents you from launching simply 10,000 nodes at the drop of a hat, which is why when miners vote, that vote carries a lot of more weight and when fully validating nodes vote, we don't really count that because anyone can start them. And this remains a fundamental problem in how you implement a decentralized democracy, if you like, with voting systems within Bitcoin um, to make decisions on controversial items. Do you just give all of the power to the miners um, or do fully validating nodes have an opinion? And there have been a couple of different approaches to that, including the idea of fully validating nodes running a blockade or embargo on miners. And this is called a user activated soft fork or UASF. It's a political move by fully validating nodes to not accept miners blocks if they don't vote a special way. And that is another way of exerting power without proof of work. And people have even suggested that you should only vote by applying a signature against uh, public keys and Bitcoin addresses that hold a lot of money. And what is that? That's proof of stake. So effectively, people have suggested of using a proof of stake like system where people with lots of money in invested in Bitcoin have a bigger vote. So this is a complicated problem and we haven't solved it yet. Um, but the best answer we have is 
miners' votes matter. Uh, fully validating nodes do not matter unless they're running a full blockade or embargo on the miners. Will asks, I noticed on slide six that the current version of Bitcoin Core is 0 0.21.1. My understanding is that with most software versioning, once the software is launched, it is usually denoted as being a 1.0 version. Why has Bitcoin Core versioning not moved to a 1.0 version in the early days of the network going live? Is there any significance to this? Did early developers feel the network had not been properly launched? Or is it just a case that versioning was overlooked and deemed to be non-important? Um, great question, Will. Um, this has been discussed extensively. Um, software really should only transition to a 1.0 version when it has passed the beta stage of testing and is considered to be ready for full-scale production. And for many of the Bitcoin uh, core developers and others who have participated and observed this process unfold, um, the Bitcoin system is not considered to be production ready because as an entire system, um, the concept of digital currency using proof of work is still an experiment. It's a massive scaled experiment, which is now worth a lot of money, but it's still experimental. It's still developing. Um, and there are still potentially critical bugs, as well as uh, changes that are happening to adapt the network to new circumstances. So the version is not an accident. What it is telling you is that Bitcoin is still experimental software. It is not uh, finalized production ready. Um, there are still fundamental changes happening in the way the system works that are not simply bug fixes. And that's why it has not moved to a 1.0. You could say that Bitcoin is still beta software. And that's deliberately done by the developers to indicate that after 10 years, uh, version 0 0.21 is still beta software. There's no plan or agreement as to when people feel comfortable to make it 1.0. Horatio asks, how can SegWit save space if the information is included in the block anyway? And how does that relate to the virtual byte? Is it not a byte always a byte? Uh, great question, Horatio. Um, SegWit doesn't save space in practice. You still store all of the same stuff and every byte uh, is stored on your disk as a byte and takes up the exact same space. Let's go back to the analogy. If the airline says luggage in the checked compartment in cargo, um, we only count 25% uh, of the weight for when we charge you. Uh, does that mean that the luggage weighs less? No, it weighs the exact same. The difference is that the airline is just charging you less for the same amount of kilos if you put it in a different part of the plane. And that is exactly what's happening with SegWit. It's an accounting trick. It's a way to encourage people to move their signatures into a different part of the transaction to increase adoption of SegWit. And essentially what it does is because there was a limit to the maximum amount that was allowed, this allows you to expand the limit to up to four megabytes by discounting the luggage that goes in, in the checked side, essentially in the SegWit side. Um, without changing all of the software to increase the limit. And this is because if you forced all of the software to change the one megabyte limit, that would be a, a hard fork. It would be an incompatible change, meaning that if you did not upgrade your software to accept blocks larger than a megabyte, um, your software would end up being kicked off the network and hard forking. Uh, it would not be a backwards compatible change. By essentially hiding that extra data in SegWit, those who don't upgrade still only see one megabyte in the block because to put it using our analogy, the old clients are only weighing the luggage that's in the overhead compartment. So they see that you still are um, agreeing with the weight limit that everybody agreed on they're not weighing the stuff that's in the checked luggage. And so as a result, they can continue to agree that the weight is the same, uh, even though you're now carrying up to four times more um, by essentially tricking the old clients. And the reason for that is because we wanted this change to be backwards compatible, to not have to force everyone to upgrade their software. 
Horatio asks, if my node is not SegWit updated and tries to spend a SegWit transaction, my transaction will be rejected by the network and also the other SegWit nodes will ban my node. Is it possible then to reconnect my node to the network again? Perhaps that happened accidentally. What are the rules to ban a node? One lie and you're out? It's a great question, Horatio. Um, no. The simple answer is that the current ban in the Bitcoin network only lasts 24 hours. There's another number of reasons why that's done. First, because as you said, it could be an accident. So as long as you don't continue to lie, you'll only be banned for a maximum of 24 hours. Uh, after 24 hours, if you come back and lie again, you'll get banned again for 24 hours. So if your node keeps lying, it will effectively keep being banned for 24 hours. The reason, the other reason for that is because the way your node is being banned is by its IP address. And one of the problems with that is that in certain environments, many, 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 many computers share a single external IP address. Let's say, for example, that you have a corporate network uh, with a firewall that's translating all of the IP addresses. You may have one public IP address and maybe thousands of computers running behind that. The same when you're running a home Wi-Fi network. So if one of your computers uh, makes a mistake and your the address that would be banned is the public IP address that it appears to the rest of the internet to be using. And so as a result, the ban would effectively ban every computer on your network that is sharing that one public IP address from accessing the Bitcoin system. And in order to prevent uh, that from happening, the bans are relatively short-lived. It's not a one ban and you're out forever. It's that specific node will ban you for 24 hours. It's not even everyone because you don't share your ban list with anyone. If my node says Manos's node is lying to me, I'm banning Manos. I'm the one who's banning. My node is banning Manos's node. Nobody else knows about that. Manos's node can now go and connect to someone else. Can't connect to my node for 24 hours. So the ban isn't as strict, if you like. It's a mechanism to prevent um, someone from taking over a large number of nodes in the network and propagating lies effectively in such a way that um, the nodes that are operating correctly cannot get the truth because they keep connecting to liars. So it prevents that kind of takeover. It's almost like a anti-denial of service attack. Benjamin asks, by removing the signature at the end of the transaction data, SegWit addressed this issue since the transaction ID now created by everything else makes it impossible to tamper with the transaction ID. I've already explained this. Effectively, the transaction ID previously also calculated the signature and that because the signature couldn't um, make... Uh, the signature couldn't make itself immutable. It could make everything else immutable. Um, people could modify the signature in a way that it's still verified and therefore modify the transaction ID. So I, I already explained that the best I can. Um, it's not an easy concept to understand, uh, but again, it doesn't matter that much. As long as you understand that all the people were doing with this attack was changing the transaction ID while keeping everything the same. Who pays, who they're paying, how much they're paying. Piotrek asks, would a VPN service make a ban not working? Yeah, and this is another reason why the ban isn't that strict because if I ban you and you're coming through a VPN service, I've banned the exit point of the VPN service, which means everybody who's using that VPN server to connect uh, to the Bitcoin network is now effectively banned for 24 hours. At least my node has banned everyone using that. 
Milo asks, with SegWit, how can the validity of a signature be ascertained if the signature is stored separately? Can you kindly explain the mechanism of how the two are connected for verification purposes, how the verification protocol finds exactly which transaction refers to which signature? Um, when you have a SegWit-enabled client and it asks for transactions, it gets transaction and then it gets the signature for that transaction together. Uh, and therefore it can validate that transaction and its signature. So the signatures are separate, but SegWit smart clients still get um, the signature and the transaction together in a single packet and therefore can validate that signature. Um, it's just carried in a separate part of that transaction packet rather than in the, in the uh, place where the transaction had the signatures before. Um, so the signatures and the transactions move together through the network as one block. Only old clients that haven't upgraded will get a signature without the witness and can still validate that because it appears to be valid. Um, essentially, clients that have not upgraded are no longer validating signatures. Um, but everybody who has upgraded, and that's 99.999% of the network, is validating the signatures because they receive a transaction and its signature together as one bundle to validate it. Renato, that question is probably a bit off topic for now. If you put it in the q and I'll try to get to it in a second. Uh, Wolfgang asks, Wikipedia says, SegWit locked in July 21st, 2017. Slides uh, uh, P15 writes August 1st, P16 mentions August 23rd. Which is the correct, or what is the difference between these events? Um, SegWit has a three step activation process, so all three of them correct. They refer to different steps in the activation process. The first one is the July 21st date, is the date that SegWit was locked in. Um, and that means that the votes that the miners were putting inside the blocks um, activated the feature. The feature was activated according to BIP9, uh, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was BIP8. Um, and that activation counts blocks and says how many blocks um, of the past, uh, so many blocks are voting. Um, and once the vote reaches a certain threshold, that means that the uh, voting is locked in. The feature will be activated. The feature was then activated on August 1st, which means that on August 1st, uh, um, everyone activated the SegWit part of their node, or their node automatically activated the SegWit verification part um, once because the votes are in, but it doesn't activate immediately. It activates at a specific day. We usually call that the flag day. Think of it this way. Uh, in the US, we have elections in November, but the president doesn't start until January. And then the Congress is voted in um, within the first few weeks of January, right? So there's a difference uh, between the time of the vote, the time that um, the feature is activated. And then August 23rd, I believe, is when the feature started being enforced by the miners, meaning that uh, they would reject uh, blocks the, that contain SegWit transactions that were malformed. So it started uh, basically enforcing SegWit uh, on the network. I think that's the three dates. Hari says, can you please explain uh, in some detail why this was a problem? If a bad player modified the signature data of the transaction, wouldn't that transaction be uh, rejected by everyone on the blockchain? Conversely, wouldn't the transaction with the correct signature be confirmed by everyone? There, thus seems there is no chance that the bad player can trick the sender into resending. I'm missing something. Can you please explain? Well, um, when the bad player modified the signature data of the transaction, they modified it in such a way that the transaction was still valid. As I said, let's say the signature was the number three. If you write it at zero three, 
it still validates as three when you plug it into an equation. But if you took a fingerprint of that transaction, because of the extra digit, it would have a different fingerprint. So you have two valid transactions, both valid, with different transactions ID, transaction IDs, both doing the exact same thing. They're spending these inputs to these outputs with these amounts. Nothing has changed in the transaction except the transaction fingerprint. And yes, I explained that before, but I want to explain what you're missing, which is how someone could use this to cause havoc on the network. It was used in one particular category, which was at the time we had an exchange called MTGOX. Uh, MTGOX had a very poor implementation. Instead of looking to see if the inputs, the UTXO had been spent, uh, it would simply send out transactions to the blockchain and then look for those transaction IDs to see if the, if, uh, the transaction had gone through. So rather than looking at has the UTXO been spent and how much confirmation does it have, it would simply say, does the transaction ID already exist on the blockchain, in which case it's gone through. What that would do is people would do withdrawals on empty Gox. Empty Gox would create a transaction and send out the withdrawal amount to the user's wallet. The same user could then malleate that transaction that Empty Gox signed and create a new transaction with a new transaction ID that still sends them the withdrawal money. But that transaction ID, the malleated one, was invisible to Empty Gox because it wasn't correctly configured. So empty Gox would say, oh, the withdrawal hasn't gone through. And after six hours, it would send the withdrawal again, but the withdrawal had gone through. And when empty Gox would send it again, it would spend different UTXO. So the user would get the money again and again and again. And using that attack, attackers were able to drain the hot wallet of empty Gox and essentially steal um, what is now worth several billion dollars. All right, let's talk about Lightning now. Owen asks, if Lightning Network so far has solved Bitcoin's issue with security and trust, and it makes it easier to transact Bitcoin in a cheaper basis, what's the point of SegWit? Uh, SegWit happened uh, four years before or three years before the Lightning Network. And the purpose of SegWit was also to enable uh, the Lightning Network. Basically, it means this. In the Lightning Network, the participants, the endpoints of a payment channel are exchanging signed transactions between themselves that they do not put on the blockchain. They keep these transactions simply as a guarantee uh, and they hold them unconfirmed on their own computer. If for whatever reason they have to close the channel, they can use these signed transactions to close the channel. But that only works if nothing has changed in the funding transaction because the transactions they're holding, the unconfirmed signed transactions they're holding that are their only guarantee they can get their money back from the other participant in the channel, those have the, the UTXO transaction ID uh, of the funding transaction. If you could malleate that transaction ID, that would break the security model of the Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network depends on not having transaction malleability so that it can allow people to hold signed unconfirmed transactions um, that are still valid in the future. Uh, SegWit made it possible, opened the door for the Lightning Network. We could not implement the Lightning Network on a blockchain where transaction malleability was possible. Uh, because people would be able to cheat their channel partners. And so SegWit is still necessary because transaction malleability um, would break the Lightning Network security. All right, um, on the Lightning Network topic in slide 21 of week five, uh, sorry, uh, Kafai Jason uh, Kong asks on Slide 21, it states that payments are more private than transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, meaning lightning payments are more private than transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, 
Can you help elaborate further? Yes. The simple um, explanation of this is that when you make a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, you broadcast that transaction to everyone and it goes in the blockchain and everyone can see it. And then they could run statistical analysis, correlation uh, between all of the addresses that are shown in the transaction and try to figure out who owns this Bitcoin and who they're paying um, by correlate to get to addresses um, that are tied to someone's identity. So privacy um, is very difficult to achieve on a network where on the one hand, you're giving your identity to companies that are sharing it with surveillance systems, uh, for example, exchanges. And um, you are then using with your wallet uh, Bitcoin from those addresses that have been associated with your identity um, to create other addresses and other payments. So you can do significant amounts of correlation there. The Lightning Network scales Bitcoin simply by not broadcasting any of the payments. The payments are only made um, between the two participants of the payment channel. And the only people who know who was being paid are the sender and the recipient of the payment because it uses onion routing. And those transactions are never put on the blockchain. Instead, the only thing that is put on the blockchain is the transaction that opens the channel and the final transaction that closes the channel that is basically a summary uh, that allocates the balance of the payment channel. Um, and you don't have to close a payment channel ever. You could just leave it open and have the money moving back and forth. Uh, and therefore, if all you see is the beginning and the end point of a payment channel, and there could be 100,000 payments that went back and forth through that payment channel, you can't tell who has been paid. Let me give you a simple example that helps explain this. Uh, let's say you're running a supermarket and you only accept cash, right? Um, rather than credit cards. Well, credit cards don't have privacy because every time someone puts that credit card number in and pays the supermarket, that's given to the credit card companies and the surveillance companies so they know who paid the supermarket. Um, but if you pay cash, if you think about it from the perspective of the supermarket, the supermarket starts the day by making a cash withdrawal maybe from the bank and filling the supermarket cashier's draw with cash. And that cash is there for giving change and to open the supermarket. And so all the bank sees is a withdrawal at the beginning of the day of the cash that fills all of the cashier stations. Now, throughout the day, they will take and give and take and give and take and give cash back and forth to various customers. Maybe some of the customers are even using the cash back feature and they're giving their credit card and getting cash back from the cashier. So the cash in the register will have plus minus plus minus plus minus amounts all day long. At the end of the day, they take the cash in the drawer, collect it from all of the cashiers and they deposit it back in the bank. The bank only sees the final amount that's deposited. They see the first amount as a withdrawal, they see the final amount as a deposit. They have no idea how many customers went through the supermarket, how much money they spent with each transaction. They can't tell. And that cash in the drawer may have changed hands a thousand times. Um, and so that's exactly how the Lightning Network works. Essentially, you're withdrawing from the Bitcoin blockchain and putting it into a multisig. You're then doing all of these back and forth transactions that only you see with your payment channel partner. And then when you close the channel, if you close the channel, because maybe you have a safe in the supermarket and you put the cash overnight, so you never deposit it back in the bank, then um, you're the only one who sees it. When you uh, close the channel, that's like putting a deposit back in the bank with the remainder, but no one can see how many transactions happened while you have the channel open. Jason's second question is, with regard to privacy in Bitcoin, how has it evolved and what's next? Is the current state of things a perfected one in your opinion? No. <laughs> um, unfortunately not. Uh, Bitcoin's privacy is insufficient. Uh, and um, the Bitcoin network is not, in my opinion, finished. However, 
as you mentioned from one of my videos, I talk about protocol ossification, meaning that when you implement a protocol in a lot of devices, it becomes more and more difficult to change it. It hardens. Uh, ossification means turning into bone. Um, so it hardens in such a way that you can't change it. And so um, it's, it's questionable whether Bitcoin will ever get strong privacy. We have the protocols to do it. There are zero knowledge protocols that are used in uh, blockchains like Monero and Zcash. Um, there are um, ring signatures. There are confidential transactions that are used in the liquid network, which is uh, an experimental version of Bitcoin um, that runs in parallel. Uh, and yet those features don't exist in Bitcoin. They could exist in Bitcoin, but they would require changes to the protocol. At this point, there's probably too much um, reaction, if you like, uh, from many of the companies that have invested in Bitcoin because privacy would be too controversial. Meaning that if someone introduced a change that made Bitcoin fully anonymous by encrypting addresses using ring signatures, zero knowledge proofs, and encrypted amounts using bullet proofs, range uh, proofs, such as confidential transactions, um, you would essentially get the type of privacy that you have in Monero, but with a liquid or Zcash, but with the liquidity of Bitcoin, which would be an absolute game changer. But it would also make Bitcoin um, very, very risky for regulated companies because the regulators would crack down on that immediately. In many countries, uh, regulated ent entities are banned from using fully anonymous private uh, cryptocurrencies because they can't be traced. And so um, big American companies, for example, would be very reluctant to accept changes that would make Bitcoin fully anonymous. So I don't think it's done. And I think this is a major flaw within Bitcoin um, that makes it uh, insecure in terms of privacy. Haris asks, Lightning, is Lightning the only way to remain anonymous? Don't regulators ask Lightning operators to perform KYC? Well, Haris, here's the interesting thing. Uh, first of all, they don't yet, but they might at some point ask Lightning operators to perform KYC. Lightning operators, first of all, are not regulated entities under any legal system uh, today. Um, if they were, and, and that would be difficult constitutionally, one of the problems you would have is that Lightning operators don't know who is making the payments. Because of the onion routed system, if I'm running a Lightning node and I see a payment coming from Manos and going to Haris, I don't know if Manos is the originator of the payment or simply relaying the payment on behalf of someone else. So I don't know if Manos is the first node in that payment chain or just an intermediary node. Manos doesn't know if I'm the recipient or if I'm forwarding this to someone else. So Manos doesn't know who the recipient is. And if Manos received it from someone else, they don't know who the sender is. Now, when I for forward it to Haris, Haris doesn't know if I'm the originator. They can't see Manos. They see only me. And I don't know if Haris is the end because I can't see further than that. So all I see is Haris and Haris might have another nodes they're forwarding to afterwards. So all you can see is who sent it to you and who you sent it to, but you don't know if those are the endpoints. I can't do KYC and I don't know the identities. My node doesn't know the identities of any of these uh, people. So effectively to request KYC in any practical way would be to ban the Lightning Network, which again is difficult in a rule of law system because it's, a, it's exactly the same as cash. Um, and cash is anonymous. If someone suggested cash in today's world, um, people would say that's a crazy idea. We can never do it. And yet the entire world ran on cash for thousands of years um, without KYC. And apparently that wasn't a problem for thousands of years 
Renato asks, in a CBDC system, is this the opposite? Because banks and governments will see everything. A CBDC system is a surveillance nightmare. It is a totalitarian financial system where um, the people running the CBDC can not only see everything, uh, you have zero privacy, but they can also, without any due process, simply turn off your ability to access the entire financial system. They can basically erase you as a participant in every marketplace. They can make it so that you can no longer buy food, travel on trains, take a plane, um, anything. Uh, and in fact, this is already happening in China, where there are uh, government-owned payment systems and people have been uh, blacklisted so that they cannot use their money to buy a train ticket, for example. Dora asks, what would be possible reasons for closing a channel? On the other hand, possible reasons to leave it open. Uh, I'm going to just go to that in a second. Um, yeah, let's, let's do it now. Uh, possible reasons to close the channel is it's become too imbalanced and you're no longer having a good flow, but there are ways to rebalance it. Um, honestly, the only reason you would close a channel is if the other person who is on the other end of the channel goes away, if they stop connecting to you for an extended period of time. So the only reason my lightning node will close a channel is because my channel partner um, has disappeared, is no longer connected to my node. And if that happens for an extended period of time, my, uh, my node will close unilaterally, will close that channel and pay the fee in order to recover the balance of the channel because I can no longer close it cooperatively or continue to use it because I can't um, make any transactions on it. So that channel is effectively dead and, and if it's dead, I need to get my balance back. Um, so that's why. Kari says, so for those who want to buy Bitcoin to huddle without everyone knowing about it, Lightning is the way. So this will follow up to the privacy question. Um, Lightning is better at privacy, but Lightning privacy is not absolute. Um, if a surveillance company, or rather, we know that this is already happening, but surveillance companies can run hundreds, thousands of Lightning nodes, and even run Lightning nodes that are very well funded, very well connected in the network, so as to basically um, be able to correlate every transaction that's going through the network. If they have sufficient nodes in the network uh, with sufficient channels, then they can use correlation in order to track lightning payments with much better accuracy. Again, this is a statistics game. There's never any certainty in this, but they can unmask the senders and recipients by having enough lightning nodes. Now, this is much more expensive than Bitcoin surveillance because with lightning, you have to commit Bitcoin to the payment channels, but they can afford to do it. They are multi hundred million dollar businesses. The surveillance companies are very profitable because what they're doing is they're selling the privacy. Um, and this has a cost in blood in the real world because when you sell the privacy of uh, a democracy activist in, uh, in a country in Russia, uh, for example, um, the next day they fall out of a window um, or get poisoned. Uh, so uh, this is a business of uh, where they have blood on their hands, but it's very profitable. The Lightning Network is not 100% private. Nothing is 100% private, of course. While it's better than Bitcoin, it's not uh, necessarily as private as you want it to be. Um, and this goes to the next question, uh, the previous question rather. SM asks, so it seems to me that Bitcoin needs to serve as a base layer underpinning many other crypto layers. As a base layer, it can't really have the degree of privacy of something like Monero. It's like one has to work from the Bitcoin base layer and then opt into more privacy-centric technology, et cetera, et cetera. 
Unfortunately, that doesn't work. If you don't have privacy implemented in the base layer, it is much more difficult to implement privacy in layers above. And that's because in the base layer, you can do the kind of statistical analysis that can break the privacy of any layers that depend on it, just like doing statistical analysis on channel opening and closing of the Lightning Network gives you some significant advantages that are then allow you to break the privacy of the Lightning Network itself, because you can monitor channels. Um, so no, we need privacy in the base layer. You can't have a base layer without privacy and then try to implement privacy on the layers above. Let's see, we've got another 20 minutes. Um, I think I've covered all of the topics that are in this week's um, topic. Um, I, I have not been able to get to all of the questions from the forums, uh, but I've covered the ones that are most relevant. So I'm gonna go to the Q&A uh, and continue from there. Piotrek asks, is implementation of the SegWit causing data to be removed from the blockchain? No. Um, all of the signatures are still there. They're still stored by fully validating nodes. The only nodes that don't store SegWit data, um, that don't store the signatures, are the ones that haven't upgraded to SegWit, which on the Bitcoin network today is a vanishingly small number of nodes uh, that are irrelevant. Probably uh, a small computer buried in some closet that's been running for the last six years without being updated by anyone running a very old uh, version of the software. Because the thing is, if you have a Bitcoin client that is robust and implemented correctly and configured correctly, it can run for years without rebooting, without updating, without changes, and without getting out of sync with the consensus of the network because all of the changes made are backwards compatible. So if you had a Raspberry Pi Bitcoin node that you were running in a closet somewhere um, that hasn't been rebooted for six years, which you know on some operating systems you can actually do, it's not very secure, but it's still running. So that's the only computer that wouldn't be validating SegWit signatures, um, only obsolete nodes. And therefore, there is no data removed from the blockchain. Uh, the vast majority of nodes that are operating with the SegWit rules have copies of all of the signatures. Um, they just store them in a different part of the transaction. That's it. As I said, we're carrying all of the luggage on the plane. It's just in the cargo space instead of the overhead compartments. It doesn't make any difference in, in the security and validation of the signatures. And by the way, this is the kind of thing that has been subject to a lot of propaganda, meaning that people who don't understand how this works have said repeatedly, SegWit is not the real Bitcoin because um, no one is validating signatures anymore. That's a lie. Or uh, SegWit is less secure because no one uh, stores the signatures anymore. That's a lie. It's not simply a confusion because it's a deliberate lie in a controversial system in order to spread propaganda. Salim asks, uh, during the course of business, there are a lot of crypto companies emerging claiming to have mining farms. However, mostly are, most of them are scams. How can we avoid or even report such companies in order to keep good crypto practices? You don't need to report or do anything. Um, Mining scams rely on people believing that they can invest in these things and they will get money back from mining. And almost all of these things are Ponzi schemes, mean, meaning that when you invest in these things, your money doesn't go into mining. Uh, they can even show you all of the mining stuff they have. But it's easier to just pay uh, previous investors from the money you got from new investors, which is the definition of a Ponzi, than to put it to mining. Um, I would say the following statement, uh, to a very high probability, 
every single uh, mining company that is a cloud mining company that claims to be an investment that you can invest and mine without having mining hardware, where you're mining with somebody else's mining hardware in the cloud is a scam. Every single one of them is a Ponzi scheme or can become a Ponzi scheme very quickly and very easily. Um, for example, if the difficulty uh, or profitability of the system changes because of increases in energy price or whatever, they're just going to switch to doing a Ponzi scheme. You'll still see profits if you're an early investor. Um, and then they'll tell you that they're having difficulty withdrawing your money. And if you send $500 more, they'll withdraw your enormous fortune that you've accumulated. And it's all lies and it's all scams. There's no need to report these people primarily because they're all over the world. They're impossible to find. Um, uh, law enforcement doesn't really care or work to stop these frauds. And so what you need to do is not give them money and tell everyone you know not to give them money. And when someone says, hey, I found a fantastic investment and this is real, um, you need to have the, the understanding to say, actually, this isn't real, this is fake, and maybe you think you got some returns, but um, it's a Ponzi scheme and you're going to lose your money. Um, starve them of money. And the way to starve them of money is to starve them of ignorant investors who can be scammed by educating people. Renato asks, what is the purpose of the Merkle tree and how the verification of hashes works in the Merkle tree? The primary purpose of the Merkle tree is to be able to lock um, all of the transactions into the block so that the block header, which has the proof of work, um, commits not just the block header, but all of the transactions that are accompanied with that block. Essentially what you're doing is you have a fingerprint of the block header. That block header contains a fingerprint um, of the contains the Merkle root, which is a fingerprint of all of the transactions because all of the transaction fingerprints go into the Merkle tree. Each level of the tree is fingerprinted up until you get to the root. The root is the final fingerprint that depends on all of the transactions. So it commits all of the transactions so they can't be modified. Then you, if you put that Merkle root into the block header, then you calculate a fingerprint of the block header that commits everything in the block header and the root of the transactions, which commit all of the transactions. One of those transactions is the Coinbase transaction, so it commits that. In the Coinbase transaction is the root of the witness, so it commits that. In the root of the witness, you have the, commit, the fingerprints of all of the signatures, so it commits those, which means that the fingerprint of the block that carries the proof of work inside it commits every part of the block, which means every transaction, which means every signature because of the Merkle root. And all you need to do is have one fingerprint for as many thousands of transactions you have. The second purpose of the Merkle tree is as an efficient mechanism to prove that a transaction is part of that Merkle root without having to calculate the fingerprint of every transaction. So one way you could, you could do this, one way you could commit the, all of the transaction is simply to take all of the transaction fingerprints, concatenate them together, one after the other, make a train, fingerprint, 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 and then take all of that data and fingerprint it. But what if I told you, prove to me that this transaction is part of this? Well, the only way to prove it is to recalculate that fingerprint. And to do that, you would have to calculate and concatenate all of the transactions in the block. If you have 1,000 transactions, that would take you 1,000 hashes. If you had 5,000 transactions, it would take 5,000 hashes to confirm one of them is in there. If you had 100,000 transactions, you would have to do 100,000 hash operations just to confirm that one transaction is in there. In computer science, we would call that an ON algorithm, meaning that the order of the algorithm is N. The number of calculations you have to do 
n is equal to the number of items in the algorithm, the number of transactions. If you put them in a tree, you only have to calculate the hash at each level of the tree and one of the transaction hashes. Because the tree is a binary tree, the number of hashes you would have to calculate um, for, let's say, a thousand transactions. Um, I've got to do my binary correctly here. It's, I'm not going to try to do this in my head because I'm going to do it wrong. I don't do uh, exponents of two in my head very well. All right, so um, how do you figure this out? You have a thousand transactions. A thousand transactions in decimal um, in binary is, oh boy, come on. is eight bits, right? no, it's not eight, nine, 10 bits. So um, you can basically calculate 10 hashes um, for the 10 trees in order to um, prove that a transaction is part of that tree. So if you have a thousand transaction, it only takes 10 hashes to prove, not a thousand. If you have 10,000, transaction, it only takes, what is it, 14 uh, hashes to calculate. Uh, so every time you do one hash in the tree, you can double the number of transactions you store at the base of the tree. And this is not limited by anything. You can make a tree as big as you want. Um, so for 100,000 um, transactions, instead of needing 100,000 uh, hashes, um, you would only need in binary, you would only need 31 digits. No, something like that. 31 hashes. So I, ho I hope you understand. So the purpose of the Merkle root is to optimize uh, our ability to prove that a single transaction is in the tree. Now, think of this from the perspective of a lightweight client. Uh, you're only interested in one transaction. <coughs> you're not a fully validating node. You want to be able to verify that the transaction that just paid you has been confirmed, but you don't care about any of the other transactions and you trust the miners to do their job. How many um, hashes do you need to receive as proof in order to validate that your transaction was included? You know the hash of your transaction, the payment that you're expecting. You've seen it on the network. You asked other clients to tell you if that transaction appears. Now you want to find out, is it included in a block so that I know it has one confirmation or however many blocks? And you have the block header, so you have the Merkle root. How many hashes do you need to receive over the network to prove that your uh, transaction is in that block in the Merkle root to prove to yourself? Well, you only need um, 12 hashes. If you ask another client that's a fully validating node to send you the Merkle proof, they will send you 12 hashes. With those 12 hashes, you can connect your transaction at the bottom to the next level up, to the next level up, to the next level up, all the way to the root. Then you see that root in a block and you say, okay, my transaction was in that root. It was part of that tree. And therefore it has one confirmation. And you've done that by receiving only 12 hashes on um, the wire. So you've saved a lot of bandwidth. Um, maybe there were 4,000 transactions in that block. Um, you didn't need to receive 4,000 uh, hashes in order to validate it. So it's a mechanism for summarizing data. You confirm using a shorter path to the Merkle root. Yes, and that shorter path is called the Merkle path. Um, so 
to explain this very, very quickly, if I have a transaction at the bottom, right? And I want to confirm that it's included in the hash above. Well, the hash above is calculated from my transaction and the one next to it. So if I have the one next to it, I can hash them together and I have the one above. All right, now I'm here. How do I get to the level above? Well, all I need is the hash next to it because I have this one, I just calculated it. If I have the hash next to it, I combine the two and calculate the hash above. Okay, so now all I need is the hash next to that. If I have that hash, I can calculate the one above. So if I ask for a proof, what I'm sent is the one next to it for each level that takes me all the way up to the root. And I can then reconstruct all of the uh, intermediate hashes up the tree until I get to the top. That Merkle proof is a much shorter path because it's a log to n. It's in the order of the second degree logarithm of the number of transactions that you have. Are there other projects behind the uh, Lightning Network to uh, create more scale? Um, not in Bitcoin, uh, but yes, there are many other um, projects that have implemented scaling solutions. For example, in Ethereum, um, the mechanism used to scale today that is absolutely the way to scale going forward that is being proven to be very efficient is a zero knowledge roll up. Uh, ironically, this ties very closely to what we described in the Merkle root. Um, it's, a, it's a zero knowledge way of summarizing uh, many, many transactions into one in a way that you can prove that a transaction is part of that summary without knowing any of the intermediary transactions or the details of your transactions, which is why it's called a zero knowledge proof because you don't know anything. Um, so it increases privacy and um, it allows you to stick a lot more transactions into a single transaction. Uh, that is not implemented in Bitcoin. There are other ways of doing that. Mimblewimble is an example that's been implemented in Lightning Network. All of these use some form of zero knowledge proof to create summaries of transactions. What are the criteria that the Lightning Network chooses the middle nodes to pass the transaction through the channel? Is it certain that a transaction will pass by other nodes? Um, great question, Dora. That is not certain. Um, in fact, if I'm sending a transaction or payment, uh, in Lightning, we call them payments, not transactions. If I'm sending a payment in the Lightning network from my nodes to some other recipient, I construct the route. My node, the sender's node, constructs the route. And this mechanism is called source routing. It's when it's not the nodes in between that decide how to route it. I make the route in advance um, to reach the final destination. In fact, I can break my payment into many smaller payments and route them through separate routes um, more efficiently. In the Lightning Network, therefore, I have to construct a route. I then send the payment along that route, and each of the intermediary nodes doesn't know what the route is. They only see their, they only see where to send it next. It's like a series of nested envelopes. They open the envelope they just received. They don't know where it came from. And they find an envelope inside that they send to the next node without knowing what it contains. Um, and so none of them know what the route is. Only the sender of the payment knows what the route is, but it's not guaranteed to work. So I have to wait to see if it reached the destination. And the way I, I find out that it reached the destination is that I get an onion routed payment hash backwards that proves that it received it was received by the recipient. Then I know it's successful. And if it hasn't been successful, what do I do? I wait a bit, I construct a different route, and I try again, just like uh, delivering packets on the IP network. You try, if it gets through, you get an acknowledgement. If it doesn't get through, you send it again through a different route uh, and retry.
So that's exactly how routing works on the Lightning Network. And look at that. We finished all of the Q&A with one minute to go. Great questions today. Um, I hope you uh, were able to understand. These are difficult topics. So don't worry if it's not clear the first time, the second time, or the third time. Um, these are complicated technical topics, and they keep building on each other. Uh, hopefully, all of the things we talked about today help you also understand the topics we discussed previously, and it's all coming together slightly. Uh, thank you for all your great questions. I will see you next week, week six. Um, I'm Andreas Montanopoulos. I've been your teacher for today. Thank you so much. Study hard, ask questions in the forum, and I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone.